Uh, thank you guys for uh, being here. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, this is my first talk, so <laughs> don't hit me too hard. <laughs> uh, I'll try to do my best. Um, hope you enjoy it. Um, so let's start. Um, let's, uh, let's have an introduction what the company, uh, what Birding does, just so you guys know what the product is all about and what we are doing as development. Uh, basically, um, we are trying to compete in deploying satellites in space. And right now, it's quite expensive uh, using bigger rockets, such as Falcon and so on. And there's now like a new trend of the industry to have uh, new rockets that are cheaper to deploy satellites. And uh, this is one of them. Uh, it uses a 747 airplane and attached, you can see a rocket. Basically, uh, the rocket takes off with the, uh, the airplane takes off with the rocket and releases it, uh, saving some uh, costs in, during this uh, procedure. And then it, it takes off, uh, the rocket you know, takes off and then goes to space and releases the payload. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's basically what it is. Uh, basically, the payloads are not enormous. Uh, it's trying to break a new uh, industry for new companies to start deploying their own satellites to deploy um, whether satellites easier or there are some companies that want to deploy internet in other places around the world. So it's going to create... Uh, new opportunities for lower price. So for first, I have to say thanks to my team, uh, mostly, obviously, my software team, which I'm very thankful for uh, all the things that I learned with them. And uh, yeah, wanted to say publicly uh, about me. I'm, a, I'm the software developer for the uh, safety system for the rocket, the main you know, engineer. Uh, this is the rocket that you see behind. Um, it's kind of large. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, before, this is the agenda. So I, I want to have an idea what people were like the best intentions here to see how I can take it better. Um, would you mind raising your questions, uh, your hand? Uh, the people who's more interested uh, in the code per se or having an, an, an overview of what it takes to build a rocket. Like, you prefer like have an overview of the rocket from the system standpoint of view and uh, having uh, getting to know what it takes, how you make decisions based on those requirements for the software design. Yeah. OK. <laughs> let's take it like this. OK. So let's have, so I'm going to try to do my best. Obviously, I cannot disclose uh, very specific information. Um, so I'll try to do my best in answering questions. Uh, my best knowledge that I can. So first is the rocket engineering overview. This, then we're going to talk about how to uh, have a system design based um, on your requirements, high requirements for critical systems. Then uh, we're going to talk about error handling. Uh, what are one of the uh, approaches you guys can do? Uh, one thing that I should say right now is that error handling is very subjective sometimes. People. You know, if you follow your error handling policies very uh, consistent and you test it and it works, well, you know, I cannot say it's bad, right? At least it works. Um, but I'm going to show you some methodologies that you should consider, uh, you know, for your code basis. And uh, finally, uh, testing. For the testing, um, how when you write critical systems, it's so important to test absolutely um, everything that is being done. And, when you actually design the architecture, it's so interesting that most of the effort goes into having an architecture that you can test absolutely everything. Uh, obviously, you want to make it maintainable, and we're going to talk about those things later. But it's so important how testing changes everything. Um, one thing, uh, simplicity is the soul of efficiency. I like this uh, phrase a lot. When you build critical systems, uh, there's another saying, if I'm correct, it goes like this. Uh, anybody can write computer uh, code that computers can understand, but good programmers write code that humans can understand. So when you have a critical system, it's so important simplicity that it's so clear the workflow. Uh, you don't want to have something too intermingled that can lead to errors. So 
There's one thing there. Uh, why do we want critical systems in the first place? Well, for instance, we have in uh, 1986, the European, European uh, Ariane 5 rocket, it terminated due to the developers, uh, if I'm correct, they disabled the assertions. And what happened is that uh, there was a, a floating point uh, number uh, uh, casting conversion to uh, unsigned integer. So that caused a hardware overflow that wasn't seen because they disabled assertions. So they were running the greater, yeah. Well, no, I'm not sure about that because why they didn't get it, but basically lack of testing, uh, not checking um, the ranges for uh, your algorithms, right? You need to make sure when you're running an algorithm, you need to make sure what's the range for the mathematical equations that you're running where they are undefined, not only when it's divided by zero. That's pretty obvious, but you should know uh, what parameters the whole algorithm works for. Okay. Um, this is like a close-up for the rocket here in, on the front. You can see the payload is, has two stages. Um, the first stage takes you uh, horizontal-wise up to a space. And then the second one is used to uh, go vertical, if you will, to deploy the, uh, the payload. Yeah. Okay, so what are the basic challenges? I mean, there are tons of challenges in a rocket. Uh, I'm just going to name, name few that I consider very important for us. Uh, radiation, I'm going to talk about that one later. Temperatures, uh, well, as you're closer to the sun, obviously it gets hotter. When you are close to orbit, it changes between shade and direct sun to direct point to the sun between these uh, temperatures, 248 and minus 148. So, you know, materials are going to support a lot of stress. Uh, vibration, well, basically you have a rocket which is going around 20 to 30,000 miles per hour. And, uh, you know, any little dip with the air, it can cause a huge vibration. Um, the fuel is not too efficient. Well, that's quite interesting. Even though we're going to low orbit, uh, we don't need to have like, the most efficient rocket in the world. Uh, but by definition, rockets, they're not too efficient by the law of conversation, the law of... Uh, uh, conservation of momentum. Uh, you know, I believe, if I'm correct, if you want to use a rocket to go to another star and you want to go within a person's lifetime, you will need to have in fuel all the energy of the shown visible universe as fuel <laughs> uh, just to be able to go within 80 years to Alpha Centauri or something like that. So it's a uh, and the problem with that is because when you have fuel, you have to bring the weight with it, right? So that's, that becomes a problem. Right? right now, there are new technologies. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar. There's something called the electromagnetic uh, drive that supposedly breaks the, uh, the law of the conservation of momentum. And what it does is like a closed capsule that you radiate microwaves inside. And then it starts moving by itself without having any contact with the outside. Uh, you guys can Google it. It's very interesting. Um, so those kind, type of things we might be using uh, maybe to go to very far places. But to go to low orbits, rockets are perfect because uh, we can work with the deals of the weight of the uh, fuel. OK. Any questions so far? OK. So. <coughs> on radiation, there are different things that need, need to be considered uh, when we have hardware that we're going to run software on top of it. Um, two important things that can happen on the gates of the memories, whether it's an L1 cache or even the registers of the same processor that is running the instructions, like the program, the program counter. Um, the, those are gates, right? It can be implemented with MOSFETs or BJTs or whatever it is. Uh, if you have radiation, it has to be ionizing radiation. So what that is is that um, the atoms, sometimes they, when you knock out the electrons on their last orbit, they become ionized and they can change. They, they try to, by the electromagnetic force, to try to create new bonds. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's the danger of ionizing radiation 
because you can basically change the structure of things, right? So that's why you know we don't have we don't have X rays a lot through us because that can change the structure of our DNA, for instance, right? Um, well, that happens the same thing with memories and uh, processors. When you have ionizing radiation hitting those gates, uh, it's likely you're going to change the structure of the uh, material inside, and you can change the voltages. Now, if you change the voltages, how, how is that going to happen? For instance, you have a MOSFET. You can create a shortcut between the, the drain and the, and, the, and the gate, I think. And you can consume a lot of current, and if you don't shut it down, that's going to burn the gate, it's going to burn your processor, it's going to burn the memory. That's, called, that is what, that's what is called a single event latch. It's when you have radiation, and you don't stop it, because it's going to keep running the shortcut. A single event upset is just, it hits it, but it comes back again. The problem is that you lost information. You had a one, now you had a zero, and that becomes an issue. So what type of radiation is going to affect? Basically, ion, uh, any, any one which is uh, ionization, ionization uh, radiation. Uh, for that, we have alpha, beta, gamma. Basically, alpha is just uh, you know what we call quarks, just uh, protons and neutrons. Um, beta is, uh, you know, belongs to the family of uh, leptons, where we have electrons, and uh, also neutrinos. And then gamma, you have photons. Photons, as they reach the frequency higher than ultraviolet, they have enough uh, energy to knock out the electrons of your atoms, they become ionizing. So that, uh, in that regard, you can see gamma rays, X-rays, and so on. Infrared is below there. It's, it's, it's on the other side, so it's safe. So, <coughs> okay, so what do we do to prevent ourselves from a single event upset? Well, vendors, they have something which is called ECC, an error correcting code. So error correcting code al allows you to uh, write back the original value that you had if you had radiation, which is awesome. Uh, procedures to, that, that run these algorithms for ECC is called memory scrubbing. It's writing back the original information that you had. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, so on ECCs, there are, there, there's, it's very important when you have processors that you're gonna send to space, right? Because when you have radiation, radiation I mean, it happens, but it's not like a bunch of it that is going to change your software right away. It's very, it, obviously, as the die is bigger, as you have bigger memories, there's a higher probability of having a bit changing its state. So uh, you should consider having ECCs when you have, you know, your main memory, obviously. Uh, as it comes to catches, to, ca to catches, um, L3, L2, and L1, some vendors offer up to L2. Having a sale on L1, um, it's kind of hard. <laughs> you have to be very unlucky. But uh, still, some vendors, they, they add ECC to those levels. Now, very critical applications should use ECCs on all other levels. So that would be L1, L2, L3, main memory, and also uh, NAND flash, NOR flash. So you correct everything, right? Um, but it's still, you should consider at some point whether that's necessary if you're not overdoing it for what you're trying to approach. Uh, also, you have, also vendors offer radiation hardened components. Those are processors or memories that even if they don't, they, when you have radiation, the material doesn't change. So you won't have a change of, basically they're trying to avoid single event upset and single event uh, latch up by the material they're using. The problem is that there's not a lot of demand for these processors, and they're very expensive. So you're always going to be way behind, right? Like it's going to be a processor that is not nearly as close to an ARM A8 or, you know, or Intel, you know, whatever. It's behind. Okay. All right, so he was asking what about um, having like what is called um, uh, a triple uh, modularity redundancy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to mention that a little bit later. Yeah. One question. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you were talking about cosmic radiation, right? Right, <coughs> radiation, yeah, cosmic right. Radiation. Well, it can be any, I'm not sure what you mean cosmic, like that it doesn't come from the Earth as well? Or? Uh, why I'm asking this because I don't know if you have any benchmarking 
like how the radiation is changing on the lower orbits where, uh, compared to on the Earth. Because on the Earth, you also have this effect of frequencies because of the cosmic radiation effect. Mm -hmm. So let me rephrase the question. So what you're saying is that you have um, less radiation as you're closer to the Earth and more outside. Right. But yeah, so, so that's totally. In the lower orbits, you will have much more cosmic radiation. So. Right, yeah. So basically, uh, we are protected by the uh, Earth's magnetic field. That helps a lot. So as you go further and further, the impact of radiation goes uh, higher. Since, we're, for instance, we're deploying satellites uh, in lower orbits, uh, the impact of radiation is not that big. But if you're going to Mars, yes, <laughs> you know, you should consider it. because, it, And then obviously, the probability of having a SEU or a cell uh, increases not only by the size of your dive, but also as the flight, uh, you know, the, the flight mission is longer, right? Okay. So, okay, so let's say we want to design our own critical system. So what's the most important thing? Oh, I want to go to Mars. Well, that's cool, but Clearly, what do we need to actually get approved to actually go there? That's the most important thing, right? So uh, there are different institutions that uh, allows you to certify so you're able to fly. For instance, for rockets, uh, you need to be certified with the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. For medical devices, you have the FDA 510K, and you have other ones like the IEC 61508, and so on. So, uh, you, it's, it's almost impossible to say, I'm going to fly with everything that you want. There's always like a negotiation that you say, you know, this is good, this is not. Basically, what they want to make sure is that not that you have a mission assurance, not like they don't care if you don't go to Mars. But they do care so that you don't kill anybody when trying to send the rocket. You know, when you launch the rocket, you don't want it to land anywhere except the ocean if there's a, an error, right? So they really want to make sure, uh, you really want to make sure that you are covered what we call safety, right? A mission assurance is more like a nice to have down the road. It's like, yes, we made to Mars, but um, just not killing every, anybody at first, that's a huge win already. And, and, and sometimes it's, it's not as straightforward to, to do that. And think about it, you have a rocket with a bunch of fuel that wants to explode, and you're going at 20,000 miles per hour. Right? So it's, 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 um, it's interesting. So. Um, as you define those requirements and you say, you know, uh, we're going to deal with them and we're going to make sure we can work out something together, right? I'm going to comply with these requirements, but if it's doing like this or, or like this or like that, you start identifying the risks from that negotiation. And those risks have to be very, very clear uh, in case something happens that's critical. So from the, let's see, from the Harvard perspective, um, you basically... When you're designing a critical system of okay, care, we're all software developers and you know, we want to make a really nice software. But in order to make a very reliable system, you need to have the best software uh, um, um, procedures, right? But on top of that, you want to be covered by hardware. And if hardware fails, well, you want to be covered that the system, when it fails, is safe, right? Like, um, there are systems when they fail, they shut down safely. You know, they, they don't, I don't know, let me think of something. Uh, like if you say that you have an electric knife and then you turn it on and then when you shut it down, for some reason it closes back or something like that. I don't know. So you know that if the power goes out, you won't have a sharp knife pointing at anybody. That's, that's kind of safe, fail safe. Um, so it's very important that, uh, you know, if, when you have these systems, um, the fail safety is a must, and the fault tolerance, you can start playing with that, right? So you can say, oh, uh, we can have a, if I'm correct, for instance, the Boeing 747 has like a triple redundancy system. So if two processors go down, still you have another one which is going to save you, right? Um, you can get away only with one fault tolerance, right? Like you can say, well, I am only going to allow one fault to happen, and I can keep working. Right? And if something happens again, well, I'm fail safe. So uh, those are the type of things you negotiate with the FAA. Yes. Any questions so far? Or is it just 
I was going to talk about that later. Turns out that testing rockets is very hard because they're very expensive. See, like when you develop, I'm sorry. So he was saying that um, why things go wrong when we launch a rocket in a launch pad. Like, you know, what's going on? Uh, right? That's, that's basically what it is. It's not so much that. It's we know sometimes they fail because we just, we just watch TV. Though. Right. Okay, so basically what... What kind of repercussions that do for the company? Do they, do they close down the company or do they just... I'm curious what happens you know, to your organization. Okay, so what, what kind of re repercussions we have if something goes wrong when we launch a rocket and this, how is it going to affect the company? I think that's a very open question. It depends on the company, their budget, you know, like uh, how much can you afford? For instance, the, the 1996 uh, European rocket that I showed, if I'm correct, that cost the company like 300 and, or the, you know, the, the European agency $370 million. Right? I don't know how many companies can deal with that loss, you know. It's, it's, it's relative to the company. Uh, but one thing is that it's hard to test a rocket. Why? Because it's so expensive. You develop a phone application, Oh, you're running your computer and your phone. Oh, it didn't work. You can have it there all night long until it works. A rocket. <laughs> you're going to send 1,000 rockets? Or, you know, you, you cannot do that, right? It's super expensive to test a rocket. So basically what you want to do is you want to try to cover everything with so much testing to make sure you have covered everything and you will only know if it works until you launch. And, and, and still, even if you put so much time and effort trying to develop something very reliable, Things can get out of watch, you know, like we're humans. But the idea of following strong requirements and procedures should alleviate those things or should try to improve the probability of success. So we already talked about radiation, as you see, uh, temperature protection. Uh, well, that's more on the outside of the rocket. Uh, I think I'm going to go a little bit faster. Uh, processor cores. So, you know, like we were saying, for instance, uh, there's something which is called locked step. Sometimes you can have two processors which are checking each other's instructions. So if, if they say, oh, I should be here, are you there? Yes, you know, uh, Freescale, for instance, they have one of these and lots of vendors, they have those. You can have a triple modularity. There's three processors running all the instructions at the same time. And if one of them fails, then it's democracy. What the other two says, are you agree? Okay, great, so let's run this instruction, right? Uh, designing software for this type of architectures is, uh, it, it takes longer, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very, um, it, it's something that, uh, you know, it, it takes more effort, but it's, uh, it's rewarding. And again, I'm just for the disclosure, I'm not disclosing any specifics for Virgin Orbit, obviously, <laughs> so just saying in general, okay. So. I'm sorry? So you are running your code in triple modular. Well, that's a good question. I, I think it depends on libraries that you're using. It depends on so many different implementations. Uh, I would consider that like a very open question. It depends how deep you want to go, right? You can tweak specific things at the bottom, or you can use different abstractions so you don't have to deal with that, right? Uh, how much efficiency, how much uh, um, performance you want to achieve. Maybe you want to start tweaking down the road, right, at the bottom. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's like it. okay. From the software perspective, uh, so, okay, we have decided the hardware, right? Now we know we, we, we feel safe, we feel tolerant. Yes, we're moving in the right direction. Okay, so comes the question, critical systems, and most of the people, they jump right away into, oh, we need an RTOS, a real-time operating system. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, discussions on the, on the website whether we should use a real-time operating system or regular OSs. And, uh, you know, this is like a kind of a, I don't know, like a long discussion, right? So basically when you use an RTOS, it's because you want to have predict, you want to predict accurately how the system behaves. You don't want a lot of jitter, but you don't want to. RTOS doesn't mean performance. It means it's very predictable. 
you, you know it's going to do something at this specific time and very accurately, right? Not all of the critical systems need to run with the, this exact timeline. You can have you know, some buffer in between because you're running calculations that are not that critical and you're okay. You know, if it is with, between this time window, it's fine. You know? So it, it all depends. So yeah, it's not jumping into those conclusions right away. You need to see your timing requirements, how fast you want to process your information. Say that you, know, you have a specific critical system and you want to be processing the information from the sensors. Right? How fast do you need, how often, what's the frequency that you need to read those sensors for you to provide like a reliable system that changes based on the configuration. So um, here we have um, one way to, to implement the OSS is, is that sometimes you want to have isolation. You want to run your critical applications that won't be affected by other applications that are not as reliable, right? So if we have, for instance, one operating system and we're running two processes and one process, you know, you have a really good application that you wrote super reliable, but the other application fails. It's going to, you know, maybe you can bring your OS down, right? Okay, so now your application is going to go down as well, right? Like if you did something very wrong. So they're coupled somehow. One way to mitigate that is to use a type one hypervisor. So type one hypervisors, they lie around this level. And what they do is that you can run different operating systems in the same die and each operating system gets assigned different cores. And if one of these OSs completely dies, you want the other one, we we'll never know about it. Super reliable on the other side, you, you're super okay. No, no problem. And uh, you know, uh, some uh, operating systems, for instance, for instance, Linux. Well, Linux has a very well uh, reliable virtual memory system for each process where uh, pro uh, other processes won't be able to interact with your memory unless you allow it by shared memory, right? Or, you know, but so you could say, you know, I'm going to segregate one core to one application. In that way, I can gain more performance and other cores to other ones. You can play with these configurations. Um, again, nothing is a hard stone. It's not like this is better than that. It's how do you negotiate with the FAA? You know, are they okay if this fails? Great. Yeah, because you're fault tolerant here. Great. Okay. So I'm just showing you different options. But again, take from me that, oh, this is the way it must be done. It depends. It depends from the requirements, but here you have the options to play based on what you have, right? Any questions? Oh yeah, they're super involved. <laughs> they have code reviews. So yeah, they're gonna have a good look into you. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. So now we decided the hardware, the software, also fault tolerances, everything. What's next? Let's write, let's start writing the code. Okay. I've seen so many organizations that they don't have good documentation. Good documentation, I've seen lots of developers, they don't like it. I learned to appreciate it so much, so much. Before I was like, oh, it's okay, but now I know it's critical. See, when you're developing a critical system, like, you know, let, let's, let's rewind a little bit back. When we develop, we say, oh, you know, I need to do this interface. And then you think a little bit and you say, oh, I have a good idea, and then you implement it, right? And you think it's great, it's great. Are you sure you really took into consideration everything? Oh, yeah, of course, why? Because it looks good in your brain, you know, because, oh, it's awesome, right? Well, no, those decisions cannot be done like that because you need to make sure, you, you need to have a lot of time to analyze a very clear and serious workflow. And you need to analyze all the different paths the workflow is gonna go for. And then you're gonna consider if each of those nodes can fail. And then what you're gonna do? And if they cannot fail, well, great, right? But you have to have a very clear logic documentation for everything and that is from the top application to all the way to a system call. All, everything has must be covered. Once you have a very clear workflows, then you may say, I can start writing my code. And if you're gonna make a change to your software because you have a great idea, well, make sure the FAA is okay with that, right? Everything has to be very, very well calculated. And so, but th this is good because when you have really, now obviously, maybe going too fast, but 
this doesn't apply for everybody. I mean, we're just talking for critical systems, right? If we have like a, an agile environment where our customers are changing the, you know, the requirements all the time, well, that's gonna be kind of hard to have a workflow for everything, right? But if we know how the system should work, we should have documentation right away for everything. And this step may take some time and it's critical. And I would consider this the most important one. <laughs> Actually writing code is, you know, it's just making this logic work. But this is very, very important. So my advice is workflows. And when you write really good workflows, that's the key to write really good interfaces, to write very clear code. Write a workflow that you read it, you say, no, it sucks. I'm gonna show it to somebody who doesn't know about the system to see what he thinks. When you show your workflow to somebody who has no idea what your system does, but he understands right away, you have written a really good class interface. Most of the time, <laughs> not necessarily, but most of the time, right? So take time in expressing that logic, and that's how you achieve more, uh, you know, that's a simple design, very reliable. And as you write the documentation, make sure all of the requirements from the FAA are covered. That way, you make sure the code is covered as well. Uh, well, as it says, the software architecture must match this logic as well. And as I mentioned before, as you do the workflows, make sure that you account for every single possible failure. That way you know what you're gonna do. Okay. Okay, so what, what, do, def what do, do we define? Hold on. Okay, so when you say, okay, something failed, what do I do? Well, it depends on, it depends on what you're doing, right? Testing rockets is hard, it's expensive. So maybe you don't wanna kill the application. You just wanna kill it until, you know, wait a little bit longer, right? Because telemetry is gold, you know? And just having a rocket out there and sending you data, whether it's not working or it's working, is awesome. Because it's gonna, you're gonna get that data and you're gonna fix it, whatever happened, and then next launch is gonna be so much better. There are other systems that you can, you know, test easier. Uh, it all depends, right? But. I would say try to push the hard error to terminate the application in critical systems just to the point, obviously the last minion, the, the last, like the last position before it actually hurts somebody, right? That you know you're safe, you're safe, you're safe. Maybe it's not, nothing is working, but you're safe. That's fine, I'm not gonna hurt anybody. Oh, I'm gonna hurt somebody? Okay, <laughs> done, right? But at least you got all these bunch of telemetry you can get away with and you can analyze and you can go from there. So from software, uh, this is pretty straightforward. I'm pretty sure everybody's, maybe I should, yeah, well, okay. Solid principles, you know, make sure you follow solid principles, uh, you know. Uh, I, I don't think there's much to talk about there. It's pretty well known fact. And class designs, you know, when you write the software architecture, uh, make sure that you have the workflow. <laughs> have a class design where you have a clear interface, right? And also think about what data structure you're gonna use or what design patterns or whether you're gonna use, what type of inheritance, right? You're gonna use an interface or you're gonna use a base class that is gonna provide you some sort of common code for something else or whatever. And also number of threads. Now think about when you have number of threads, that's, that becomes tricky. When you have critical systems and you have multiple threads, it, 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 you, you, you should be very careful how you're doing things because when you have multi-threaded code, you have race conditions, you start adding more complexity to the system than needed. So everything must be very, it's not like throwing threads just because oh, it looks better or better performance. It, it's, it's about safety all the time. Uh, libraries, well you may think that just uh, very expensive libraries are the ones that are using rockets, not necessarily. Libraries that are well maintained, uh, for instance, uh, what I do is, Sometimes I talk to the maintainers on an email, right? I, I read what they're doing, I test their code, and I notice, oh, I found an issue. I'm gonna send an email to see how fast they reply, right? You start seeing their interaction if it is active, and then if they have a code base which is very well unit tested. And then when you go through their source code, at least there's good documentation, you could argue, you can use that library for your application because you know exactly what's going on, and you can test it. So, uh, there's, there's no like a hard decision, use this or use that. It's, it all depends on these factors. And also, when you have libraries that are used just for initialization of the rocket. So let's say that we are in the launch path and we turn on the rocket, right? Something fails because of a library, but you know, nothing exploded, everything is fine. Okay, 
Make sure that for initialization is fine, but for runtime it has to be very, very picky, right? You don't want in runtime something to go wrong. So libraries that are used in runtime are way more picky to be chosen for reliability purposes. Any questions? Yes, everything, like everything. <laughs> like. Okay, so for software development, this is for the FAA. I guess most of the organizations follow this, at least for safety critical systems. Uh, test driven development, so obviously every single commit must have their tests. And the unit tests that they should have should not only test all of the interfaces from A to Z, right? But uh, should also test performance or should also depend on uh, some dependencies that it has. You have to be super picky with unit tests. That's basically, uh, we're gonna talk about it later, about unit tests, but it's critical. Uh, obviously, ticketing system. Ticketing system should match requirements, right? FAA wants you to do this, you should be able to connect them and say, this ticket is gonna help with this requirement and so on, at least you know you're complying with everything, right? Repository, well, I don't think there's much to say about it, and I'll use. Build server, on the build server, you know, you can have continuing uh, building your code, right? We want that to, we want it to, we want to be testing as many things as possible all the time. So you may wanna have in the build server not only unit tests, but also integration tests, right? So when you have the final of your software, you should have, say, another piece of software which is testing your software, right, based on mocks. However you're doing, try to make sure, to, if, if you try to add more unit uh, tests every time you push something to master, or before you merge to master because you know it's been compiled to be reviewed, uh, try to run as many things. So before the build server tells you, tells to your team to review, it has passed so many unit tests, integration tests, that finally code review is, comes into play. So it gives you more reliability. Yeah. So what, what, what kind of metrics I use to make sure that the unit tests match the requirements? Exactly, and also that the unit tests like, fulfill like, the policy Right, so basically, when you write your documentation and you write your workflows, guess what, that's also checked by the FAA. <laughs> right. So if you have a software architecture that really reflects uh, the workflows, since the FAA also review your software architecture, <laughs> so make sure that your classes are tested based, like what I said before, right? You know already what your class should look like, right? So you're gonna just try to, when you run unit tests, basically you're just trying to do bug hunting. I actually have a phrase later, right? You're just trying to, to check, right? You're not saying, oh, this works, awesome. No, you're just trying to say, I wanna find a bug, right? So try to hit it hard, right? Try to, try to make sure all the, uh, con like the preconditions and postconditions of all the interfaces have been tested, right? So if you have a constructor that accepts a specific type, make sure that those ranges have been tested uh, very carefully. As I mentioned before, when you have, a, say, a class that is calculating an algorithm and is expecting I don't know, three doubles or whatever types they are, well, make sure that those combinations of types is not gonna lead to something weird, like an underflow, overflow, or, yeah. Well, I guess it's because you didn't write a unit test, which is good enough, right? <laughs> That's the thing, right? You, you have to, uh, I'm sorry, so he was saying, when you make a change in the unit test, uh, you know, say for performance, and then it passes, how do you know that later on that's gonna affect you because it passed the unit test? Well, there's a problem with the unit test. That unit test is not actually measuring the performance needed. So uh, unit tests are, like I spend more time in code review sometimes in unit tests than anything else because everything has to be to the limit all the time um, if you can, right? Um, yeah. 
Yes. Uh, how much time an average takes uh, for uh, the field server to actually verify that before uh, each commit before it comes? Well, uh, it depends on what you are testing, how you're testing it, right? So, for instance, let's say that you have a class that is waiting for an elapsed time to happen because you know you're waiting for a sensor to come over, right? Well. You're testing on a server. Server is maybe it's not using the hardware that you're using in the rocket. So you use mocks, right? So you want to use a mock, great. But maybe you can create a mock for the time as well. You, know, you don't need to wait one minute to run, but actually you can set one minute virtually, and then it can jump and everything. So you, you can you can start playing with the dimensions of time as well, right? So you can run a test that in real time can take one year, right? But you can simulate it faster and actually can be very reliable if you do it correctly. Right. Depends. OK, so let's go to error handling. So we have software. Uh, oops, let's run the next one. OK. I well, like this one. Software testing is for like hunting. It's bug hunting, right? That's what we're trying to do. It's not saying like it works, it's saying at least we didn't find anything weird so far. <laughs> so, OK, so what type of errors we want, right? Okay, we, we want the ones that are hard errors, like, oh, nothing is going to happen, or like, oh, you know, we need to terminate or whatever, right? So those are like the most uh, crucial ones that you want to leave for last. You, you don't want to kill your safety critical system. Imagine if it is an artificial ventilator and, you know, you kill it. Well, you're going to kill a lot of things as well, right? So uh, the last thing you want to do. Obviously, I think this is very obvious for most of the people, right? You always want to try to have compile errors uh, more than anything else. And there's always a way to get away with it. And it's, sometimes it's not as straightforward, you know? Sometimes we, we just get carried away by so many things because we're thinking in so many details that we forget, oh, I, maybe I could have done this check in, run in, in compile time. So always put a lot of thought when you decide uh, whether something is giving you an error in initialization, because I've seen, based on my experience, so many opportunities to refactor code and actually make it much better, where you can get away with uh, compile time. Now, on initialization, well, if you're going to start the system and it fails, whew, we didn't lose the rocket. OK, that's fine, right? Or you start like an artificial ventilator before you give it to the patient. OK, it didn't work. OK. Let's get another one, right? So it's OK. It's not ideal, but you won't kill anybody if at least the operator who's managing the device is not doing something crazy with the patients or the end users. And runtime, if it is critical, I have to say it's unacceptable, right? Uh, I mean, it's bad, right? You don't, you don't want that. <laughs> OK, so some examples of compile time. I like this example because basically, when we have a, an, a code base and there's an error, what do we want to do? OK, we want to log the error, right? Because we don't want to kill the application completely, right? We want to keep working. What if there's an error on the log as well? What do you do? You're going to lose that in precious information? What if, what if that error was telling you uh, crucial information about the system and you're going to miss it because you did something wrong and the class is not going to be able to send that specific message, right? So obviously, there are things that we cannot control completely, but there are things that you should be able to ensure for your own uh, concerns. That is, you're writing an application. The application should be able to have post conditions assured up to the moment it calls a system call. So you should never have uh, you know, calls to system calls that can fail because your application is sending something that doesn't make sense. <laughs> if it fails because the kernel did something wrong, OK. But applications should assure at least what I did is correctly, right? So for instance, this is one way, right? Like you can have like a message, right? OK, let's say you have, you're sending uh, logs through, say, um, socket. And then usually, you know, uh, system calls, they have like a pointer for the message you want to send and then the size, right? But what if you screw with the size of the pointer that you're going to be sending, right? What if it's super huge? Well, it's going to fail. So try not to do that. You know, C++ gives you so many tools to avoid that. So for instance, let's look at this one, right? So you can have, for instance, a struct, which is not a pointer, right? You're always going to have structs. And you can get away making sure that it will never accept a pointer by using like a type trait called 
std is pointer, right? So you can use something like std enable, you know, enable if t is the same, um, if, if it is a pointer and you deny it, and, may, and you, can may, you can assure that you will never be able to have a pointer here. It's always memory that is known in compile time. Well, what's the advantage of that? You know the size of it, right? You can know in compile time what's the size of the message, and you can do something like this, right? You can assert in compile time if we're trying to send nonsense. Um, that's one example. Uh, let's, go, let's look at another one. Uh, well, this is for enable if. As I mentioned before, sometimes we have, uh, I'm sorry, how much do we have left? 15 minutes, OK. So sometimes we have classes that can have overflows, right? Uh, look, seriously, have a class to check for safe at if you're adding integers, right? You know, sign or, or, no, or unsign, make sure that you are making sure you're not going to overflow. Even if it takes more clocks, more clocks in the processor, it's fine. You're not running a high-frequency trading system, right? Uh, so the, the, when you write these type of classes, you have to define for what types they're going to work, right? You can use something like a state, like a enable if for a specific types that you, you know, your safe at is going to work, right? Such as a need on sign or a sign integer or so on, right? But at least you're making sure in compile time you're not going to be doing nonsense with the types. Okay, initialization, there's not too much to talk about of this one here. Uh, there are some things that we just cannot control, right? Like for instance, uh, there's an autopilot system for, a, for an airplane. What if there's no sensor at all? I mean, you know, there's nothing you can do. You just have to say, hey, I cannot start the system. This is not working, right? Uh, so you, what you do is that you throw, right? You throw, you're saying there's an error, and you hard throw right away. You have to stop the application. Now, in runtime, there are different situations. So, okay, we have classes that is expected to fail frequently. It's expected to fail infrequently. It's not expected to fail. Can fail depending on the circumstances and never fails. Okay, let's just start with the first one. It's expected to fail frequently. Let's say that we have a mathematical algorithm that is reading, uh, is running some calculations based on an input of a sensor which is giving you random data based on temperature or whatever. Right? You cannot know in compile time, oh, this is going to work now, or I, I'm going to throw if this is like that. Yeah? You will never know until you actually run the calculations, right? So for those things, well, it's likely it can fail, and actually quite frequently. Right? Uh, for those type of situations where you're expecting like, calculations to fail, but fail doesn't mean that there's an error. What it fails is that, uh, I'm going to show you in the next example. See, like, let's, let, let's look at this code. See, what do you think is the problem with this code? If you're writing a critical system, right? So we have here, we're creating an instance of a bool, right? Which is calling this free function calculate, right? And usually, for instance, in kernels, you see, okay, I'm going to send you, here's my data. You calculate it and let me know through the return whether it's valid or not, right? And then you say, if it is valid, OK, I can use it. Well, the problem with this is when you're writing critical code. Well, anybody have any ideas? The what? It's not valid. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, so basically, the problem with this code is that result still can be used in the code and is invalid. It, basically, the end user of this interface, maybe he misused that interface, and he forgot to check for is valid, and then he's going to use something with result, and it's going to be very bad, because he forgot to check is valid, right? So basically what you have is instances, say on this stack, this is a function in the stack, that are invalid, and you're dealing with that in your critical system. That seems pretty dangerous, right? But again, we're just sharing subjective things. As I mentioned, for instance, the kernel in Linux is reading very reliable. It works very nice. Uh, and it does things like this. So I'm not trying to say it's bad or not. I'm just saying there are some idioms you can use to try to avoid those situations. Right? So consider, for instance, in C17, we have a STD optional, right? 
okay, you can get away with this. This is awesome because you can check whether it failed or not. Great. But this only works for so much, right? Let's say that you have a class and the class can fail and it has five interfaces. So what are you going to do if, one of, if, if it fails? And how do you know if the other interfaces can be used or not, right? That, there are different ways to do it, but one reliable way. So to clarify, this one is basically, it's going to tell you, hey, this is, is the object I'm going to return to you is valid or invalid. And, and you, can, you can check it like doing something like this. Why checking it like this is good? Well, if you notice, you're creating an instance of str inside of the if. It's a scoped. That means that you will not be able to use <laughs> an invalid str over here, right? So it's impossible for the interface, if you use this idiom of the if scope, to use an invalid object of str, right? So it gives you those semantics of uh, th th that type of idiom of scoped reliable uh, objects. Let's look, at, let's look at this, okay? So this I, I value a lot, why? Sometimes you have classes, classes can fail. You have a bunch of interfaces, but you wanna make sure that the interfaces that you provide are reliable. You wanna make sure that, hey, if this constructor works, I know all the interfaces are okay. You can use them as much as you want and it's never gonna fail. Right, how do you do that? Well, I like the idiom of the safe pool idiom and how you can improve it, obviously, since it's C++11 when you use user-defined uh, conversions by using an explicit bool. So let's go through this pretty fast. So basically, on the constructor, you have a, a valid, right? The valid is gonna run some calculations to make sure that whatever, uh, maybe this example doesn't show it too good, but let's assume for some moment that in calculate constructor, you have some types, right? some arguments. Then valid is gonna call a, uh, a function, a private function to say, hey, these were the arguments that were sent to me. Is this okay with us or not? Then they're gonna say, oh, this is okay or not. They're just gonna return a true or false. Then valid gets assigned whether it's valid, right? And then the result can get the calculation. Maybe if it valid was false, the calculation that result is gonna get is nonsense. And also other result is gonna say, get other nonsense calculation because valid was false, but that's fine. Because when the moment you try to get result, it's gonna assert, it's gonna hard assert. And that's gonna show you in unit tests or integration tests, you did something very silly. If you didn't use an interface, if you didn't, didn't follow the, the, you know, what the interface was saying, right? So uh, in order for you to always avoid any assert, just follow this idiom, right? It scopes ifs, right? You will never be able to have an assert running something weird here. And you're also making sure that all the interfaces are valid. So, you know, like we see here, we create an instance of calculate, right? And then when we call the if, we're gonna call the explicit, uh, define, the user defined conversion for a Boolean. Then it's gonna get, it's gonna return valid, true or false. So this if is gonna result into true or false. And then at that point, we know that all the interfaces are valid. They're not gonna assert. So what happens to those asserts when the rocket flies? One of the reasons why you have the critical failure in the uh, European agency is because they disabled asserts. And you sh uh, the, what I propose here, and again, I'm not trying to say this is the correct way, but what I, the, the philosophy that I like is that the preconditions and postconditions of the class should be assured completely. They cannot give you nonsense. That's a huge danger. In order to enforce those conditions, you can do assert. And you can do a hard assert saying, no, this is just totally, I have to abort, I'm just doing nonsense, right? Now, if you do well unit tests and well integration tests, and I just mentioned few, right? Because when you have a rocket, you have like other five or six, seven stages, like on the flight and so on. All those should pop up. And normally when you have, for instance, uh, say a critical, uh, an artificial uh, ventilator, right? You're not gonna test artificial ventilator with new features, with new patients to see if it works. <laughs> Usually what you wanna provide is something that is so tested for the procedures that you're gonna know it works, that you know everything is not gonna assert if you really run the unit test as it is, right? So uh, that's the, 
that's the philosophy I want to uh, I want to show you uh, today. Well, and so okay. So he's saying that even when you wrote the fly, uh, when you fly the rocket, you're okay like asserting, right? Or yeah. Well, basically, no. You shouldn't be okay because that should never happen if you use this idiom and if you had really good code review and also if you have really good unit tests and integration tests. What if it does happen? Well, if it does happen. Yeah, so there's there's like a limit to uh, things, right? Like you cannot say, like, that's why when I'm saying when you have unit tests, you're bug hunting, but you're not saying this works for real, right? You're trying to find issues. Uh, that's, that's why it's so important to run unit tests so much and well done. But I mean, from what I've seen so far, the probability that you have an assert like this failing is super low, extremely low, because when you have critical systems, the workflow is so simple starting with, right? And when you have clear, uh, when you have a very clear workflow and you run not one unit test, we're talking about you're gonna be running thousands of unit tests with a lot of integration tests. If this doesn't pop up because the end user didn't use the interface correctly, it's because something huge was missed in the organization. I mean, this is not a small bug, this is huge, right? This is gonna pop up right away, right? So, it's several things combined, right? But everything comes with good you know, advantages and disadvantages. What happens with what? Ultimately, what does happen? Because you must have a code pop up. You have a, a pop exception. If the rocket explodes? No. What happens if you end up running an assert? You have a code pop up. Well, if you wind up running an assert, basically what's going to happen is that the hardware that you created is going to save you, right? To be safe, right? So at least you're gonna make sure that all the people were safe. That's why you created the system with fault tolerance, to be fault tolerance or even fail safe. It say that even the power in the processor goes out, right? So um, yeah, there are risks, but honestly, based on my experience, a small risk if you don't unit test correctly as it is. And <laughs> I cannot give too many specifics for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So expected to fail frequently, yeah, infrequently, right? So you can say, okay, I'm gonna use this idiom, and I have a function which is called run one million times. I mean, a silly example. Let's say that we have a tire, and we're gonna a tire of a car, and then we're gonna run it 1,000 times per second, right? Uh, how often does a tire get flat? Well, very infrequently. Well, do you wanna check every single cycle? Are you flat? Are you flat? Are you flat? Okay, it's kind of nonsense, right? So if it is very infrequently, well, try better, uh, better things such as try and catch. Now, that is if you're concerned with performance. Why? Before having the zero cost model in exceptions, it was very expensive performance-wise to throw exceptions, right? Now compilers are using what is called uh, the zero cost model. Um, I'm not gonna claim that I know it perfectly, but to some level, it's like basically uh, compilers before the zero cost model, they used to implement the exception within the stack right before where you have the try and catch. So every time you used to call a try, you, you had a try, the system was looking where it was the catch exception handler, and then I'm gonna add that. I'm gonna register those exceptions handlers. Maybe you're gonna check also the constructors that have been created in case you run a, an exception, you're gonna run the second winding and then you're gonna run the catch handler, right? Well, the problem with that is there are several ones. You're losing performance and also all the code is in line with the one that, is, uh, that doesn't catch, it doesn't uh, throw, right? So for instance, the apply is the code that you wanna run and then say underneath you have the code that is gonna take the catch. Uh, when you have processors that they use uh, branch prediction, the in L1 cache, possibly, it can start predicting that maybe it's gonna uh, throw, right? So you're gonna, you're gonna say, oh, 
I'm going to throw. Oh, no, I didn't throw. You're going to be swapping the L1 cache a lot. You may be losing some performance as well. So in order to mitigate those things, all that block was moved to other place in memory. So when you run an exception, basically it's just a code, and there's the branch prediction won't see anything such as any type of code for the exception. And if an exception happens, yeah, you're going to pay a run trip time to run memory, but it's fine. You know? it's, it just happens very once in a while. So this doesn't pay any price for performance, and you know it's going to happen just once in a while, right? Now, this is if you are concerned a little bit with performance, mostly. Uh, something that is not expected to fail. Well, you have a velocity. What if the sensor tells you it's higher than the speed of light, right? This, that cannot happen in physics, but maybe something is happening with, the, uh, with a bug that is telling you you're higher than the speed of light. And well, that shouldn't happen. So uh, different ways to accomplish this is, uh, let's see, so you kinda, kinda can reuse the simple bool, bool idiom, as I showed before, and you can have a class that checks the constructor to say that everything works, guys. I'm so sorry, I tried to do it faster. It's my first time presenting. I think I took more time than I should. Uh, I'm not done, but they're telling me I have to finish right now. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed the, the session. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Yeah.